Hello, welcome to the Friday, June 23rd, 2017 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Minneapolis, Minnesota. At the United Storm Center today, we got an interesting diary by Xavier about a recent file that he came across that used a little bit of different obfuscation technique in order to bypass signature-based detection. Often you do find simple XOR techniques being used in order to obfuscate binaries, but anti-malware has become reasonably good in picking up some of these XOR obfuscation techniques. And I believe Xavier already wrote about that and how to automatically, for example, find the keys being used for XORing binaries. Now, this JavaScript that Xavier came across actually used a somewhat different a technique, a sort of custom obfuscation function, and he presents how to decode it and how he wrote for this particular case a decoder for the obfuscation. Of course, as he points out, there's sort of an unlimited uh, number of possible obfuscation techniques. This is really just yet another one, and uh, hopefully it'll help you recognize the next new one that hits your network. And OAuth continues to be a difficult and tricky protocol to implement the latest victim here, Airbnb. As part of Airbnb's bug bounty, Arne Svenen, a pen tester from Belgium, found an interesting vulnerability that allows you to steal the OAuth tokens from Airbnb. Now, the way this works is that it will give an attacker access to Airbnb by essentially tricking the user into authenticating via any number of OAuth cable sites, like for example, Facebook is listed here, and then stealing the OAuth token provided by this particular service. The issue here is first of all, cross-site request forging that can be used to force the user to log in to Airbnb, and then an open redirect. It's not really quite an open redirect. What's happening here is that the user ends up being redirected back to the site that referred the user and by redirecting the user from the malicious site, the token is then passed back to the site, to the malicious site, because it shows up as a refer. Interesting exploit. And again, if you implement OAuth, you definitely should take a look at this to make sure you're not vulnerable. Airbnb actually did most of the standard things right. Like for example, usually the redirect URI is sort of one of the weaknesses with uh, OAuth, they did limit this to Airbnb domains uh, correctly. In this case, the hacker also used one of the lesser used Airbnb domains in order to not uh, affect the user that may be browsing Airbnb at the same time. And DDoS extortion attacks are still a thing and we received yet another report where a reader states that they were threatened with a denial of service attack unless they're paying 0.05 bitcoins. Actually, they're getting away pretty cheaply here. We have seen other extortion attempts that ask for sort of 10 bitcoins and the like. From the current experience that we have, uh, these extortion attempts appear to be fake. So you don't have to worry about them actually launching a denial of service attack. Looks uh, like they're just threatening you. And even if you don't pay, there will not uh, be a denial of service attack. Maybe I'll write a little bit about this uh, tomorrow. Don't have any link yet to post with that, but a couple of precautions uh, that you can take if you are threatened by a denial of service attack, of course, is check in with your anti-denial of service uh, provider. If you have one, check in with your ISP just in case something does materialize that you're ready uh, to take uh, countermeasures. The one reader who reported this to us, uh, actually the affected domain they threatened them uh, with uh, does, isn't even used by that company. So in this case, it's pretty easy to proactively no longer advertise an IP address or advertise like localhost or something like this for that domain in order to not be hit by the attack. 
So if you receive an email like this, uh, forward it. And uh, if it is a domain that you can do without uh, for a couple days, it would be interesting to redirect that to one of our sensors to see if you actually see any kind of attack traffic. So it's Friday again, and uh, today I have with me Alyssa Robinson, another STI student, and uh, she recently wrote a paper about uh, auditing Docker. And now, Alyssa, can you introduce yourself a little bit? Sure. I am a, an operations manager for Cisco, uh, working on some of their cloud contact center products. Uh, and I've been an STI student for actually nearly five years now. Um, I took a little time off in the middle. Really been enjoying the program. And I am now two classes from being done. So I'm just about to finish. Excellent. So almost there at the end of that long stretch. Yes. Now, uh, when it comes to Docker, Docker DevOps, of course, really a hot topic. I remember back in the old days when I started with Linux, it was sort of change root everything and then later virtualization. Docker sort of seems to be fitting a little bit in the middle of the two. What are some of the challenges that you had sort of with auditing Docker? Um, so I, I think the challenges I was trying to address with this paper uh, were really, you know, a lot of auditors are coming in and it, it's a new technology. They're not understanding it at all. There are the security models around Docker itself are evolving and the tools that exist to be able to, to automate any of the auditing are, are pretty immature and require uh, some amount of configuration. And, you know, I think they're, they're improving, but they're, they're difficult to work with right now. So one issue that I always have with Docker is, in particular, if uh, the Docker instance isn't really running, uh, how do you audit them typically? Do you prefer to audit them while it's uh, running, or uh, do you sort of have a way to audit them at rest? So I think there's a little bit of both. I think there's tools that you can use to check the Docker file itself, and then there are other tools that you can use to scan it while it's running. And I, I think depending on the situation, you may want a little of, of either. Uh, obviously, some of the packages that you're downloading, if you haven't specified a particular version, um, you're getting whatever is new. So that means just looking at the Docker file, you're not necessarily going to understand what is running in production. So if you're doing some regular audits, let's say you may have your weekly vulnerability scan or uh, whatever you have set up, uh, how do you deal there with Docker? You just uh, let them uh, dormant or you fire them all up uh, during the scan? Uh, any recommendation that you came up with there? So there were definitely some tools that you could sort of bring up a, a container on the on whatever host is, is running your container. So you could run the, the, the skin within a, a container itself uh, and run it, you know, alongside a running container. So I think that's definitely a possibility. Um, there are also tools that you can run basically within the registry to, to take a look at uh, any packages that are included there um, that you can run sort of continuously in the registry itself and determine whether... Um, you're, you're looking at some bad packages or, or things like that. And uh, what about some integrity checks? Uh, like you, know, you mentioned that you, you can't really predict sort of what packages will be downloaded or so when you start it up, but uh, just the registry or, or how would you sort of make sure that nobody tampered with a particular uh, Docker file? So for the Docker file itself, you can um, basically check, uh, configure it to check the image provenance and make sure that it hasn't been tampered with. Um, you can check that the, the image hash. Um, and then obviously when you're building the Docker file, you can also do some, some checking to make sure that the packages that you're downloading as part of your Docker file are the packages that you're expecting, make sure that they're signed and make sure that the signatures are correct, things like that. So the signatures, uh, you would need to have a set of known good signatures then or uh, known good certificates or keys that you're trusting essentially? Yes, and so that that's uh, I think pretty typical uh, when you're whether you're installing files on a host itself or or whether you're installing files within your Docker file that that whatever registry you're using you would have um, PGP keys that you you'd trust and and understand that that's a, a good registry. You know, uh, one thing that came up uh, recently with Amazon, now Amazon is, of course, different world than Docker, uh, but that uh, people leave sort of snapshots uh, exposed uh, for everybody to download. Now, tracking down all these Docker files, you know, some of these Docker files may, of course, contain sensitive information. Uh, anything you can think of on how to sort of properly inventory your Docker files to make sure that uh, they're properly controlled? So I don't think it's 
easy to have sort of a comprehensive check to make sure that there are no secrets within your Docker files, but but it is possible to um, sort of reverse engineer your images into a Docker file or or from the Docker file itself, you know, check for certain keywords, look for password, look for dash P's, things that you would expect um, to, to show up either in a key or in in any, any type of password be, it would be included. But I don't know of any tools that you can use to, to sort of definitively say, I have not included any secrets in this, in this Docker file. And yeah, now another sort of you know, further development, I think, of that entire Docker concept that I've come across recently uh, was sort of the use of, sort of the serverless computing, where uh, you even you know, strip out more and more of the infrastructure uh, beneath your code. Have you looked at that at all, like the Amazon Lambda or uh, things like that? Uh, we're not using any of it. I know I've done a little bit of reading about it because I do think it's sort of interesting. Um, but but no, we're we're not using any of it here. Certainly. Okay. Thanks uh, for taking the time here, and uh, that's it for today. So talk to you again on Monday. Bye.